to me. Yeah, it has to be sheer. There we go. I was, I was like, this is just not right. There's a <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you, so here's a question that we have here. If you had particles that were magnetic, say sediments, that had iron, and you had phytoplankton that were not magnetic, and you put them in a magnetic field, you could align the mineral particles and not align and have random distribution of the phytoplankton particles. And could you then use that if you could measure the diffraction pattern as a methylate? I don't know how magnetic fields come into the water. Thank goodness. That would be a cool thing. Would that be interesting? I don't know. But if you wanted to. the iron particles in the phytoplankton, or you're talking about iron inside the phytoplankton? No, we're saying that the iron dominated uh, uh, mineral particles would be more, would align themselves. But they'd have to be a certain shape. You'd have to set up the pole, polar. So you'd have to say that the magnetic pole was in the same direction as the geometric axis. I think it's an interesting theoretical problem. I don't know if it would have a good application. Maybe, yeah. One more question. Jen mentioned to me that they have to make sure that they understand these. What they use in practice mean for an even the Jewish part? Yes. I don't know if you get into it. I think I took that out. Yes. Do we want to talk about it here? He's talking about it in me. A, a larger concentration of smaller particles make a steeper slope rate again. Is this a quick explanation for that? Because the difference in the size relative to the wavelength of light when you're on the level, the way that it will interact with the particle. Like at 90 degrees, smaller yeah. particles are Yeah, so smaller. the intensity of the light coming in will, it will be preferentially scattered. If it's shorter, it can set a higher energy. It will set up a stronger dipole. So um, is this good to make the point? <laughs> I don't know when that happened, but there was just suddenly a moment when circles worked. Yeah, it just, yeah. And I had a student who was a double major in oceanography and art, and yeah. she's like, I spent the entire week in my art class learning how to draw circles. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, and here you go. <laughs> There's a certain size, though, that it has to be in order. It's like the swing of the arm or something right. like that. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> just tons of practice. So Ken wanted me to make sure that I
mentioned that when we talk about the index of refraction and how light changes its speed as it enters a particle, and we sort of assign it an index of refraction of 1.02, or um, it slows down by a certain amount, that this is the, I guess it would be, what? <laughs> There's an assumption about the homogeneity of the material when in actuality we have a cell that has a cell wall and a cell membrane and it has a chloroplast with thylakoid membrane and pigments on it and it's got a, a nucleus with double-stranded DNA and then it's got like all these other Golgi bodies, all these other things. And each one of them might have a slightly different index of refraction depending upon its composition and that ends up looking like this in a model. Right? And so thinking about this as more of a reductionist view of um, all the different components within a cell. Um, so when you're trying to compare these, you have to make, uh, have an understanding that there's a difference in what's happening here. And people have tried to do other models for which they say, okay, well, I'm just going to assume some sort of concentric sphere where I will allow maybe this part to have the index of refraction of a chloroplast and this part to have the index of refraction of a nucleus and this will be my cell wall and, and sort of do it as concentric spheres or you could sort of make complexity from there. But this is a layered sphere model. Okay. All right. So some of the properties that we need to consider when we think about who's actually scattering in the ocean is we have to think about their size, their composition, whether it's the real part of the index of refraction, which is changing the speed of light as it penetrates the particle, or the imaginary index of refraction, which absorbs the light that enters into the particle, particle shape, and the internal structures. Ta-da. So the particles that we're going to think about in terms of scattering light, we're going to think about water, we're going to think about dissolved matter, um, the salts, the inorganic salts, the organic matter, CDOM and colloids. Um, we have organic and inorganic particles. Uh, we can think of the organic particles like the, the living ones or the detrital particles that might aggregate. The inorganics, we have you know, all of these different you know, sediments that are potentially covered with organic matter. We have pure minerals, air bubbles. So lots of things in the ocean are, are responsible for scattering. And it turns out that size matters. And you'll pay a lot of attention to the particle size and where, how the different types of material show up in different parts of the size spectrum and which type of theory does a good job of explaining the scattering off of particles of those different sizes. But there's just sort of an overall trend this way from the dissolved to large bubbles. Yes? No, good, perfect. Um, so a, lo a while ago, um, Daria Stramsky and Dale Kiefer looked at the size spectrum in the ocean and they said, okay, well, if we look at sort of how many numbers of particles do we see for a cubic meter versus their size, they were not the first ones to do this, but you find that you ha tend to have a lot of small things and not very many big things, right? And if you look at the slope of that line, um, that was back to what we were talking about, about steep slopes and flat slopes. And if you're looking at primarily um, biological <coughs> particles, there's some ecological theory that suggests that the slope should be about three. Which means that 
it's proportional to the cube of the diameter. So if, or the radius, R cubed, which would be the volume, right? And so ecologically, <coughs> and you can continue this on out to whales, right? Ecologically, um, when, when organisms are gaining energy, it's because of the biomass that they're eating. And the biomass is proportional to the volume. And so if you want to have a conservation of mass through your ecosystem, you would have this sort of, vol a lot of small particles will be consumed by fewer larger particles and on and on and on. And if there was no loss, there was no um, inefficiency, then you could have a theoretical slope of three. So, which is just kind of an interesting thing to think about. However, there is a lot of inefficiency. Um, but if you begin to include other particles in there, which become part of the detrital part, could that, if you included all of it, could you end up with those types of slopes? So we tend to see slopes of about three. Um, but um, different environments have different ecological status. If they're more heterotrophic versus more autotrophic, that slope can change. So, okay. so this is the scattering by water molecules. They tend to scatter, like Raleigh scattering, with the um, stronger scattering at the poles. I just pulled this out of Kurt's book. He's going to show it too, but it's just so pretty. I wanted to show you. Um, and this would be the scattering if you looked at it on a log-log <coughs> plot where you were blowing up the first couple of angles here, the volume scattering function. Um, and so we see this scattering phase function, and then if we measure the scattering coefficient as a function of wavelength, for example, for water, we see that very strong peaked scattering in the blue compared to the red, and it's been modeled with some power of about minus four, the spectral slope of about minus four, minus 4.3. And so water scatters very intensely in the blue wavelengths and not very much in the red wavelengths. However, water absorbs very strongly in the red and not very strongly in the blue. And so the light that doesn't get absorbed is very efficiently backscattered. And that's why, of course, the ocean is blue. Not because it's reflecting off the sky, which sometimes you see in <laughs> <laughs> bad scientific literature. Um, OK. So we get back to this idea of clusters um, of water. and. Um, the, pot, the uh, hydrogen bonds between the oxygen and the hydrogens are what cause it to cluster, and it changes as a function of temperature. And some of those density and homogeneities of these, between these clusters give rise to some of this scattering um, that we see. So modeling, modeling scattering by pure water as a function of temperature. Um, one could think about the size of these clusters and how that is changing relative to the wavelength of light. So, um, and again, of course, the size of the clusters depends upon the temperature. So you have much larger clusters at lower temperature versus higher temperature. Once you put salts in there, you end up seeing the water molecules cluster around the negative ions differently than they cluster around the positive ions. And um, this is a model um, sort of looking at how you can see the, as you increase the salt concentration, this is the, um, the volume scattering function at 90 degrees. And so you can see that there's a spectral dependence um, of the scattering at 90 degrees as a function of wavelength. And this was for a Sorry, I'm blinking on what this was. Sorry. OK. People have looked at viruses in the ocean. And this is, um, is Barney Balch coming this year? Oh, OK. We're hoping that he's coming. But he did some nice work looking at viruses and measuring um, the size distribution of viruses. This is just a really scary looking virus. I don't know which one this is in particular, but you know, luckily they're very small because if they were very large, they would be absolutely terrifying. And then um, looking at various types of viruses, 
and their volume scattering function. You can see that this is the water um, volume scattering function and this is what the viruses are looking like. So the viruses are more, have a, a higher volume scattering function than does water. So the question was, are they con significant contributors to scattering in the ocean? And I think the conclusion was no. But there are a lot of them out there. But they're very small. Um, but it has to be done. You have to do the work to show that it's no. Okay. Um, colloids, which are the submicron particles of dissolved organic matter, which you can actually make in the lab if you take fil filtered water and you leave it around, just leave it on the counter for a couple of days. You know, or um, if it's really high in organic matter and you're filtering and your filtered drops, your filtrate drops into your flask, that action, that physical action can also create colloids. So how you filter your water um, makes a difference in terms of colloid production. And so here's an example of looking at the volume of colloids as a function of depth um, in the ocean. And these are the, the diameter, the size distribution from 0.1 to 1 micron. So these are small particles. And then measuring the scattering coefficient off of pure seawater, um, small coilo colloids, which don't contribute very much relative to seawater, and then the larger colloids. So colloids, again, um, are sort of along this continuum between what we call dissolved and what we call particulate, and they do scatter, and they do have a spectral dependence of their scattering. Um, I should just let Emmanuel talk about this. Um, this is Emmanuel scuba diving with a spectrophotom, uh, an AC, was an AC9 on his back. This is the tube coming out of the AC9, and here's a filter in front of the tube. And you were measuring in the sediment, the pore water in the sediment. And tell us what you found, Emmanuel. So, did you do the comparison between, oh no, that's today. CG I mean, and A. You have the water where you measured the C tube and the A tube with the C DOM, right? And so in the AC meters, C equals A plus B, and you measured A, and so if you subtract it, you get B, right? So what did the B spectrum look like for C DOM? Or if you plotted A and C as a function of wavelength, were they the same? Yes? I don't know. You should check. If they're the same, what does that tell you? There's no scattering. Or at least not in the easy Right. And if there's a difference, then that means that there's scattering in the filtrate. And so the question is, is it because you left it around and made colloids? Or is there sub, mic, sub 2.2 micron scattering material? Phytoplankton. So here's the phase function for a variety of different phytoplankton measured in the lab. This is the scattering angle. And again, you see really strong diffraction and weak backscattering out here. If you normalize the scattering spectra, you can see that some, this is a detrital particle, um, or a non-absorbing particle, weakly absorbing particle, probably NAP, versus you can see again, as I talked about, these phytoplankton, there's the peak of absorption, which is decreasing the scattering at that wavelength. So scattering, scattering spectra do vary as a function of if the particle is absorbing or not. Okay. And you'll get to see that really uh, specifically today when you put a culture into the AC meters. You'll get to measure C and you'll get to measure A and derive B. And then what we want you to think about is what is the spectral variability of absorption and scattering and attenuation? Yeah? What is They just normalized it to a wavelength at 400 just so that you could look at the difference of the spectral shape. Yeah, because they had different magnitudes. And so rather than normalizing to biomass or to the area under the curve, they just normalize to a wavelength. 
And so depending upon, like if you looked at some of these spectra, it could look like you have a positive slope of scattering, a negative slope of scattering. Um, well, so if scattering, the spectral dependence of scattering is dependent upon size, one would interpret the slope as a change in size. But if you've got absorbing particles, you can, and depending upon what wavelengths you measure, you can, uh, you can appear that there's a slope that is actually not caused by size, but is caused by absorption, right? And so until you have a continuous measurement across the wavelength, which we do with the ACS, if you had the same for a backscattering sensor as well, you might see all of these different features in there that are not related to size, that are related to absorption. But when you have a, you know, just a couple of channels of scattering, you could be measuring at specific wavelengths that make you think that there's a slope, when in fact you're just in, in and out of absorption features. Yes. By viruses and bacteria, and yes, size. right, yes, no, they didn't measure, this is a model, but this is still the specter that we see, yes, yeah. yeah. so this is a model, but when we measure, and you will see this when you measure today, you will see specter that look just like this for scattering, yeah. Um, and here's more work looking at terrestrial dust sources, so these are the size distributions of various types of dust, and the mass specific scattering um, coefficients for all of these different, different things. And you can see that there's sort of a general slope from blue to green, and these are relatively small particle sizes. Um, scattering in the ocean due to bubbles. And so this is a study that uses um, acoustics to get the size distribution. And so, they characterize, as a function of wind speed, the void fraction of the water, which would be the bubble fraction, right? And then they looked at the number of bubbles per cubic meter as a function of the size. And so here is the size spectrum. And then they measured, did they measure? With acoustics, um, they measured with acoustics this size distribution, and then looked at the contribution to backscattering as a function of bubble radius for different um, depths in the ocean and different sizes. No, I'm sorry, different sizes. And so you can see that there's, in this case, there's an increase. As you increase the amount of bubbles, you increase the amount of scattering, um, and then you could look at the, rel the scattering relative to pure seawater. So when you have, you could have scattering that's lower than pure seawater with some fraction of bubbles or you can have enhanced scattering. So why might that happen in a theoretical sense? If you have really big bubbles, what's that gonna do to scattering? or if you have really, really small bubbles. So if you look in water and you have lots and lots of micro bubbles, what do we see? What's that gonna do to the scattering? Mm -hmm. Where? The small bubbles? Yeah, the small should give you more forward scattering. Why? Because more Compared to big bubbles? So let's think about if we have light coming in, and what's the index of refraction of air relative to water? So is light going to speed up or slow down? It's going to speed up. Okay. So that means that the, if it speeds up, what happens to the wavelength? Mm -hmm. It's going to stretch. So 
if we have light coming in like this, stretch and then it will come out, okay? Um, and so the size of the bubble, as the bubble gets bigger, now oh, I'm getting myself mixed up here. Are we going to get, so as we have bigger bubbles, will we get more or less diffraction? More diffraction. Mm -hmm. um, as we have particle, as we have light coming towards this, is it going to get absorbed in here? No, because it's there. So for a particle, for a bubble that's this size compared to a phytoplankton, what's going to be more, what's going to have higher backscattering? Bubble or phytoplankton? Bubble, right? Because there's no absorption. So you would have enhanced backscattering due to air bubbles. Does that make intuitive sense to you? Yes, when you see bubbly water, it's brighter, okay? Um, no, I've lost where I am. I apologize, I don't remember why I put this on here. I'll have to go back. When I find it, I will bring it back to you. Uh, it's sort of a dumb, maybe general question. Yeah. What's the difference between like reflectance and backscatter? Ah. Reflectance. Well, it depends on which one you're talking about. Maybe reflectance is too but much of a specific word. If you think about the amount of irradiance going into the ocean, and then you think about the amount of radiance either irradiance or radiance, depending upon how you're defining it, coming out of the ocean, the ratio of the upward irradiance to the downward irradiance is reflectance. Right. I don't okay. think that's um, Whereas reflection is an interface. Okay. And you could, this could be the ocean surface. It could also be a particle. Right. Yeah. So then the difference between reflection and backscatter. So, if we're talking about a particle, so, okay, we have reflection off the interface, right? We also can have light that transmitted into the particle and got either reflected off the interior, we had the refraction effect, and then it could also be reflected and it could come back and come out. But this has actually entered the particle and made it back out the back. That is backscattering. So backscattering includes reflection. Reflection does not include if you've measured it, you know, if theoretically, if you just measured what didn't go through the particle. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that possible that we distinguish them when we, when we measure, like, fast backscattering? We measure this. I don't know. Can you separate them out? Backscattering and reflection, I think only theoretically, right? Or if you could manage to take the particle and increase the absorption more and more and more until you have none of the intervals. You can't. With phytoplankton, you put them in low light and they make more and more pigment. But are you also changing their surface properties while they're at adapting to low light? And that's, I think, <laughs> the problem. And so with the air bubbles, not only do you get the backscattering, backscattering. the lack of uh, absorption. absorption. So backscatter is kind of bigger category that reflection sits is a part in there. Of, yes. And we sort of don't like it, but. I mean, well, it's, it's not that we don't it's, like it. It's just that it's, it's giving us it's giving a signal about two different processes. Right. It's right? a different signal. So backscattering is telling us about the reflection, but it's also telling us about some of the light that has entered the particle and come back out. Mm -hmm. now, now, if one could make an assumption about the reflection as a function of wavelength, right? If we could assume that that was constant, 
<coughs> then if you know that the absorption is really different in here, yeah. then you could begin to separate it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I'm done with bubbles. Okay. <laughs> so I will stop here at me theory because that is where Emmanuel is going to pick up on Friday. So that was the scattering by different types of particles. Yes. Oops. This is showing the backscattering at 550, so in the green, where one could make an approximation that there's a minimum of absorption if there happened to be phytoplankton, right? um, as a function of the void fraction, which is the bubble concentration. Yes, they are, but they're going up at a steeper slope. And this is, so this is what I'm, this is the total scattering and this is the back scattering. So if you look at the um, relationship between the total amount of scattering that you measure as a function of the amount of bubbles, you get preferentially more back scattering than forward scattering. And I think that's what Ken is talking about as you increase the bubbles because you have such a big change in how the speed of the um, light through here and also the reflective properties, the fact that it's such a high index of refraction, you get enhanced backscattering. That as you increase the bubble fraction, you get preferentially more backscattering relative to total scattering by the bubbles. And so bubbly waters are very bright. And so when you think about remote sensing, in areas of the ocean where you have really high bubble concentration, say very wavy areas, very windy areas, you're going to have a lot brighter water due to bubbles in the backscattering. Right. Yeah? Did we ever decide if small bubbles or big bubbles uh, backscattered? Bigger. The way you asked it is like, do you have more small bubbles? Or fewer larger bubbles. So, are <laughs> small bubbles more efficient backscatterers than large bubbles? Is the question. If you ignore diffraction, right? Well, don't ignore diffraction, but the fact that the large particles have much more of the diffracted light in the forward direction. So the percentage, is that, that's what he's saying. You got that? Okay, right. good. Can you remind me why that is? I think I'm like blanking on the whole diffraction. Is that like interference, or why are bigger particles diffracting more? What is causing that? So it's caused by, so if you think about these waves as crests, that are propagating, right? We, we're showing it as a ray. But think of it as crusts and troughs heading through. And think about it 
from the water, a perspective of like water flowing past an object, right? And so if you have crests of water flowing, what's going to happen when they hit this? There aren't the diffracted ones not interacting with that at all? No, but, you know, so this is going to, depends on what happens here, but this is going to slow, it's going to slow down as it, the closer it gets, right? And so you get this bending around, and then... Could I what? Can I do a slightly different picture? Sure. Do you want to draw it? Would you mind? No, do it. <laughs> Think about what diffraction is. And, and we, you, you played with it in 201, or two, I'm sorry, I used physics in Miami. <laughs> they haven't taken their 201 class. You've taken, <laughs> wherever you were, you took introductory physics, right? Everybody's had introductory physics. And they talk about diffraction. So let's look at what diffraction. And you all probably used a wave tank. Did your guy, did your class use a wave tank? No. You guys oh. didn't have any good, okay, good demonstration. So you have this wave tank, and you put an interruption there to the wave tank. So these waves are going to go, but now there's no wave here. So, or there's no, this part of the wave can't propagate. What happens at the edge here? Do you remember? It starts curving in. So this wave, and now the wave fronts will start curving like that to fill in this gap, right? Mm -hmm. And so diffraction basically is caused because you get this interruption in the wave front, and you're getting the tilting of the wave front around that interruption. So the diffraction part for scattering doesn't really depend at all on what the particle is, right? It's it's because it's obstructed the wave front. It's right. bending around there. And so um, scattering from the diffraction part is the difference between what it would have been without this interruption and what it is with the so interruption. Why is a bigger particle causing more? Why, why does the bigger, well, there's, there's two things. If you look at um, the diffraction pattern for uh, small particles versus large particles, here's the angle. Large particles have a lot of, dif the diffraction happens at very, very small angles. As the particles get smaller and smaller, this peak starts spreading out how do we say a lot of diffraction? What is that? Is a it, lot of diffraction. Like, is it order of magnitudes? It, it depends it's on the ratio of the particle to the wave. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's so. That's how you decide big or small. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And the bigger the particle, I mean, so so Ken's shown this as sort of a line, right? But when we think about it in terms of being the particle, which I, I was trying to draw badly. But what we find is when we get this sort of diffract, this bending around, right, which is exactly what he's shown here as wave fronts, it can actually impact, if this is the radius of the particle, it can impact up to, you know, between two, two to four radius away from the particle. So this bending that he's showing here can actually begin to start, you know, bending out here okay. far far so from more the particle radius, more and so bending, more so it's just a, a physically a physical space is more more diffraction is happening farther away right but as soon as you get to the smaller and smaller i mean do you really the the contribution of diffraction to small particles is really small compared to the refraction and the reflection Right? Small, if it's small relative to the wavelength. Yeah. yeah. You can just think of as this thing gets smaller and smaller, it's not going to really right. have to bend much to keep right. it. Right. Exactly. Is that where like, the analogy of like waves in the ocean passing through like, a stick versus passing through an island? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Or a big jetty or, a, or like a yeah, big jetty or a small jetty. Mm -hmm. So you can do the slit or you can do the object. You get the same thing, interestingly. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. And of course, what sometimes what they forget about is that all of the diffraction of the waves around the jetties gives rise to very strange flow patterns and erosion of beachfronts because they're like, we're just going to block the waves. But yeah, you block the waves, but you actually can focus them, right? The bright and dark spots of diffraction on the other side are 
variations in high and low energy, which will lead to you know, strange but, uh, the, the way Well, there's that, down. yes, because you're actually, the waves slow down because they're, yeah, That's why it turns the, yeah shallow water waves. Is it slowing down next to the particle? That's why it turns? Yeah. Because of the interaction. Yes, it's more, it doesn't, it refer, it, yeah. it's bending, yes. Next to the particle. Yeah, I didn't hear. Is it so it's slowing down? Next to the particle, yes. yes. No, it's it's, but that's a, the bending. But it's bending. But the wave. It has a shallowing. Yeah, so that's slowing down. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions about bubbles. Maybe, this, maybe I'm just misinterpreting. I was curious about, there's a line on the top that says pure seawater. Mm -hmm. And so as we decrease, I'm assuming that's like, as we decrease the, the void fraction, why don't we converge onto pure seawater? That, that's what I'm misunderstanding. I am too. <laughs> It's very small, and so if you add these together, yeah. So what it says is that when you have a small void fraction, you're not contributing, right? At this point, when you have this many bubbles, then it's comparable to the backscattering by water. And as you increase the number of bubbles, you will have more backscattering. So your backscattering would look like this. Dun, 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 dun. You're increasing the number of bubbles, but you're not increasing the backscattering by any significant amount, right? Straight across. And then finally you get to this point where you have enough bubbles that then you start to increase. And then bubbles now dominate by an order of magnitude over seawater. So you need a certain, a certain amount of bubbles to actually impact the backscattering coefficient. Because when you have a really small amount, their backscattering is very small. It's 10 to the minus fifth, whereas here it's 10 to the minus third. So if you add this many bubbles, you'll add 1%. Oh, so it's not measured with, like, injecting bubbles into seawater? No, it's this is the effect of bubbles, and this is what seawater is. Okay. And so here's the relative contributions, much less than seawater. And here they're comparable. This amount of bubbles has a comparable amount of scattering. So if you had that many in, you'd have the c scattering coefficient would be two times that of seawater because the bubbles are contributing the same amount as seawater. Sorry, I misunderstood. No, you did not misunderstand me. I didn't speak well. And then once you have more, you have a lot more. So then it starts to. Perfect. <laughs> They're homogeneous. And they are spheres. So you can easily go from that graph there of, of that to figure out what the bottom scattering will be. For bubbles. And then you start increasing the void fraction, how much of the uh, sample is just those bubbles. Right. You start increasing, and then you can do that other. <laughs> so it's a perfect thing to do that. Which they did. <laughs> so how do you figure out what your like, relative signal contribution is? So if you model, so he was just saying, if you could model the, the volume scattering function for a bubble of one size, why not do it for a 
bubbles of all the different sizes. And if you knew what the bubble distribution was in your ocean, you could add up the contributions of scattering for all of the individual particles to get the total scattering by all the bubbles. And then you could compare that to the scattering by the ocean in the absence of bubbles. Does that answer your question? Yes. And so here's the model for scattering by air bubbles. And this are for, um, so if this is for a single bubble and you see that, and there are two different lines for two different polarizations, but just focus on one of them. But you can see that you have these bright spots and dim spots in the volume scattering function. So remember that's sort of like if you're looking at different angle, it's bright, it's dim, it's bright, it's dim, it's bright, it's dim, it's bright, it's dim. That is the constructive and destructive interference of the diffraction around where it's coming in at different phases. The waves are, are recombining at different phases and you get these bright and dark spots. Okay. This is for one wavelength. So are you just going to model this? Yes. yes. You're going to get to do this. So yeah, you would do it for diff every different wavelength. And it would, be, it would be different dependent upon the size relative to the wavelength, what it's going to be. Right. Excellent. Write it down. Okay, we're done. <laughs>